Good morning. Welcome to the worship of God here at St. Peter's United Church of Christ. We gather this morning to stay connected, to worship, and to listen for the sacred among us. This morning, we continue our series of Anything But Ordinary, where we are invited to take a closer look at our Hebrew scriptures, stories that we might know, characters that might be familiar, and yet there's a lot untold, a lot unknown, and a lot to still discover. And so we invite you this morning to put on your thinking cap, to put on your cloak of curiosity, and to enter into this story with us as we hear about a family, as we hear about drama and trauma and the messiness of life. We invite you to listen, to look through a character perhaps different than your own, and through all of it, to see how the spirit weaves within and among them. And indeed how the spirit weaves within and among our lives as well. And so with that, we invite you to worship this morning. The reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. The child grew, and on the day of weaning, Sarah and Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah noticed the child that Hagar the Egyptian had borne for Abraham, playing with her child Isaac. She demanded of Abraham, Send Hagar and her child away. I will not have this child of my attendant share in Isaac's inheritance. Abraham was greatly distressed by this because of his son Ishmael. But God said to Abraham, Don't be distressed about the child or about Hagar. Heed Sarah's demands, for it is through Isaac that descendants will bear your name. As for the child of Hagar the Egyptian, 
I will make a great nation of him as well, since he is also your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham brought bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar. Then, placing the child on her back, he sent her away. She wandered off into the desert of Beersheba. When the skin of water was empty, she set the child under a bush and sat down opposite him, about a bow shot away. She said to herself, Don't let me see the child die. And she began to wail and weep. God heard the child crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. What is wrong, Hagar? the angel asked. Do not be afraid, for God has heard the child's cry. Get up, lift up the child, and hold his hand, for I will make of him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went to it and filled the skin with water, and she gave the child a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became a fine archer. He made his home in the desert of Paran, and his mother found a wife for him in Egypt. Welcome to a conversation with both myself, Lori Bevenauer, and Pastor Becca Lockwood. This is um, a great story that you just heard, and it's also a story that is really messy. It's a story of a family with all sorts of twists and turns and drama, and there's just no other way to put it. So um, we are entering this story in that way. We're just naming that this family reflects a lot of our families, and that was our point this summer, to not necessarily beat around a bush, um, to not hide from things, and to really look at the stories of the Hebrew scriptures and their families, and to recognize that at times they're not all that different from us, um, and always we can learn from them. So we hope that you can ground yourself in that place, that think about the quirkiness of your own family, and uh, get ready to revisit the drama of Sarah and Abraham and Isaac and Hagar and Ishmael and all of their messiness. Yeah, so the word um, that I've stuck to in this messiness is um, ickiness. Mm. And um, because whether or not you know this story or perhaps it's new, um, it's pretty clear from the, the narrative um, that we find in this passage that we're supposed to feel a little icky about it. Mm -hmm. um, and sad and frustrated and hurt. Um, and it happens pretty immediately in the scripture. Um, we find Sarah essentially watching Isaac and Ishmael playing in the sandbox in my imagination. Yeah. And she immediately feels this threat bubbling within her. And there's suddenly no room in that sandbox for Ishmael anymore. And so she immediately goes to Abraham to problem solve that and make sure that Isaac will get what is his. And um, can I throw in there that I love the word, the, the word choice of ickiness and the difference between icky and messy, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> messiness, you can clean up. Right. And, right. and ickiness, it, I mean, I guess if you work hard enough, but things that are icky generally stay icky. Yeah. Yeah, it takes a lot of work to get the icky out. So I'm going to use Cincinnati actually um, as an example. So often um, during our summer mission trip, we will do different work projects around um, the church. And um, so just as an illustration, messiness feels like organizing, you know, the peace room or one of the many closets. Um, and just reorganizing it, knowing that within a week it will be undone. Mm. But you can clean up that mess. Mm. And the ickiness, the work that it takes to undo the ickiness is like what Stevie does with our youth and buying new scrubby things for the floor every year because we scrub it so hard they're unusable at the end of it. And yep. you get a really nice clean kitchen floor at the end. 
but it takes a lot of work, a lot of hours, a lot of sore muscles, and a lot of commitment to undo that grime. Yeah, and and you know, for those who don't know our partnership with Washington United Church of Christ in Cincinnati, it, we leave feeling icky because although we can organize a bunch of closets and clean up and scrub and do it again year after year after year, mm-hmm. um, we can't clean up all the family trauma and the pain and the systemic racism and the intergenerational mm-hmm. poverty. Um, and just the the inequity and the injustice, like that's the icky feeling, and it's not just messy. So I just yeah. I wanted to derail us a little bit already, <laughs> just to say that that Sarah has an icky feeling, but it's not just messiness. No, and I think um, you also earlier used the word drama, and then just used the word trauma, and I think that's much more accurate. Yep. to what we're seeing here and understanding what generational trauma is in that in this story we're seeing that systemic racism that um systemic sexism mm-hmm. and classism and and all of the other things at play thousands and thousands of years ago which are still at work today in different ways um and we see that right here and nana sees it too and um, she's been asleep all day. But, <laughs> she's making her um, appearance. Yeah, yeah, but drama and trauma need to be dealt with differently. Yes, exactly. And, and sometimes I don't do that well. Sometimes I right. respond to drama as if it is traumatic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I ignore trauma mm-hmm. because I see it or perceive it as drama. Yeah. Anyway, back to the story. <laughs> and I think, well, I think that's helpful, though, because I think that's how Sarah responds in this moment. She, there's that perceived threat, that jealousy, that scarcity mentality that there isn't enough for both sons and that Isaac needs it all. Yeah. Um, and so she responds in a dramatic way and casts them away. Um, or asks Abraham to do that, which we read he's conflicted about doing that because that's also his son. And um, so it's understandably um, causes him to pause. And um, the thing that I've been thinking about with that request and what we're seeing in the world today, both with um, COVID-19 and with, um, you know, it being Pride Month and Black Lives Matter movement, um, I wonder if Sarah understands the consequences of what she's asking um, by having Hagar and Ishmael sent away alone, sent out into the wilderness with no inheritance, no help, you know, a a bottle of water maybe, right? Like, Right. It's not like it's just a go take a time out or I need a weekend for myself or... I'll see you on the holidays. It's you're gone. Like send them away. And that question of, did she realize what she was doing is really powerful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to believe that she couldn't realize what she was doing. I know. Yeah. But I'm not sure that that's true. I, I just, yeah. I, human nature or I don't know maybe our nature is I want what I want for myself and if the other person is a threat or if the other is somehow causing me pain I want it gone and I want it gone fast yeah so you just said something um the other I think that's how Sarah is sort of able to do this as she has effectively otherized Hagar, who was at one point her companion, her sister in this, and has now become the other and the enemy. And with whom she has a tie. Like, yeah. it's not like this was a stranger or just a random neighbor. Like, right, their family. Their family. Those boys are connected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a term that we were naming earlier is um it's a fun one to say and think about so i want us to um do it (laughs) 
Um, it's called navel gazing. And so <laughs> I'd like to invite you to just like take a gaze towards your own navel. We promise it's down there. Yep, it's there. Um, and that's sort of what's happening. There's this extreme tunnel vision of what is affecting me in my life. And, you know, we might not have the same situation exactly as, as Sarah and Abraham and Hagar, but we are invited in this text certainly to think about how our actions and what our self-interest um, demands are and how they are affecting other people's lives negatively to the point of death. And I that might sound extreme, but that's what this scripture is. We find Hagar and Ishmael crying out to God. Yep. And she at, at the moment where she has hidden him under the bush because she can't bear to watch him die. Right. Like right. And then how how fascinating is it to look at the families that then the format that the families end up in mm -hmm. as a result of Sarah's demand. Yeah. And then the the way in which God is connected to those families. Yeah. Right? So on the one hand, you have Sarah and Abraham. One could argue super traditional. Yep. I think you said at one point, you know, a kid and a half. <laughs> right. <laughs> and a dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a cat, given the situation. Uh, yeah. And then you have Hagar and Ishmael, who ultimately are a single parent and the child. Yeah. So talk about what we noticed with God's presence for those two family units, which are so familiar to us, right? Like, right. That's right. our world, folks. We have plenty of families mm -hmm. that are different shapes and sizes. Yeah. Yeah. And like both of those two families are represented within my own family, like not in all of the same ways, but you know, we can easily imagine that configuration. Yep. Um, and what we find in the text is that God is equally present with both families and God blesses both family and God calls both sons and descendants as many as the stars are given yep. to both. Yeah. Um, which, which then pushes the question, am I capable of doing that as well? Yeah. Or do, do, I, do I hold any unknown bias towards a particular type of family configuration, good or bad, right? Like, right. is there a way in which I expect a family to look a certain way? Is there a way in which I see blessing in a family that um, is configured one way at, for a while and then configured another way for another season, right? Like I, and I have to say, there are times when I catch myself, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think one of the hard things for me when reading this too is even though I feel that ickiness with what Sarah's doing, um, I can also see how she herself isn't in a tricky situation of being oppressed in her own way. Right. And I want to be very clear. The answer is not to then go oppress someone else. Like, that's not the answer. Right. You know, we hear the phrase hurt people hurt people. And that's not that's not the goal. And that's not, again, what we see the scripture suggesting at all. And yet, that's what we read. That's what we see happening a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think of this particularly with the women's movement of um, we see a lot of um, white women coming out to support each other. Nana's unhappy. Sorry. Um, and what what we see could have happened is women supporting women. And how could how could these two women who were both oppressed in their own ways, both in similar ways and then also in different ways, and even there's still status even in their oppression. Even with yeah, to absolutely. And um, how could they have helped each other? Um, and how would the world look differently if they had? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I mean, maybe now's a, a reasonable time just to name what should be obvious. We are two female pastors analyzing this passage. Right. Um, and it matters who's looking at the passage. And in fact, you were sharing in your research that yeah. early commentaries on this passage all focused on Abraham. Right. And they were all written by men. Mm -hmm. um, and I had put out there, like, if we were to ask our audience right now what stories they knew, I think a lot of people know of Abraham, and many would know Abraham and Sarah. Yeah. I think some would know that Hagar is connected to this story, mm -hmm. and that Hagar and Ishmael go together, and that somehow Isaac and Ishmael go together. But all five of those together, I I'm, I'm not convinced. Yeah. And I think we conveniently like box people out. And so then share more about what you were finding with um, different commentaries and like starting in the place of Abraham with male theologians and then movement. Yeah. So once, you know, feminist theology and, and women in the field alone, they started looking at the female characters and, oh, would you look at that? They have stories too. Mm -hmm. Not as many have been recorded, but they're there. Mm -hmm. And then a further step, you see a lot of women as theologians. So black, the black feminist theologians coming in and saying, okay, but there's a step further that we can go here and get even deeper into the text and even deeper into what God is calling us to um, and what it means to be um, a faithful person um, to each other and to God and, um, and, and really investigate how God is interacting with all of the people in all of the stories right. and how we are called to reflect that and don't currently. Um, yeah, and it's not to say that, you know, a male theologian or a, a writer um, writing about Abraham only has one perspective. Mm -hmm. It's just really interesting to see the trends in that, you know, we move from male writers writing about Abraham to female writers writing about Sarah to womanist writers writing about Hagar. And yeah. and really, I think what you and I are drawn to is the combination of all those and saying, mm -hmm. there's a story in each of these mm -hmm. and some have been given far more time than others. And aren't we richer for it? Don't we understand more if we're willing to recognize that, that this is all wrapped up in the same story? Like, right, right. there's real power in that if we actually allow the voices to be heard. Um, okay. And one could argue then, wouldn't it be interesting if the scholar who wrote about Abraham then wrote about Hagar? Or if the one who started with Hagar worked their way into writing about Sarah? Like, what is that? I think you often use the word intersectionality or cross-pollination. What does that look like? Um, and how can we grow from it? That's yeah. where I think the story gets really interesting. Yeah, and I think a way that we can do that immediately with the text is through the spiritual practice of sacred imagination and just allowing ourselves to enter into the story through the different lens of all of the people named and all the people unnamed. Use your imagination. What do you see? You know, who who are you in the story? What are you overhearing? Yeah. Um, you know, are you the kid in the sandbox? That's who I'd be. Um, yeah, what would it be like to read Hagar's journal entry when at, when Abraham came and said, okay, here's the deal. I know we once were close, and right. I need to send you away now. Can you imagine what would have been written that night? Or the conversation between, oh my gosh, the conversation between Hagar and Ishmael mm -hmm. with her trying to explain, no, you can't play in that sandbox anymore. Right? It just breaks you. Like it, suddenly we're, we're at a different question and it's mm -hmm. how could this have been handled differently? Yeah. And whose responsibility was it or is it mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. even ask the question and then to, to actually do something differently. Right. Right. I think ours, it's our responsibility. Um, especially if this is a text that we treat as sacred um, and relevant and alive, then the question and the call is definitely within each of us. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I think that reflects in our current day, 
you mm-hmm. know, how can responses be different to our own family members, to the world around us? How can we be more, well, what dawns on me with Hagar, I'm kind of, I'm kind of loving Hagar today. <laughs> yeah. Um, I learned from her wisdom because I think when, when banished, she became a person who learned, right? Like she learned how to survive. She learned how to listen. She learned how to take care of herself and her family. Mm -hmm. Not always in the most glamorous ways, but she did that. And I think one of my biggest hurdles in in these conversations about anti-racism, in conversations about the virus is to be a learner Mm -hmm. and to be open to the possibility that things need to be done differently. and I think most of us would say, I mean, if asked, we'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm open. I'm I'm open to learning something different. But sometimes learning, scratch that, most of the time, true learning is really uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. Like Hagar went through, like, true learning that leads to transformation is banished to the desert, find a new way. Mm-hmm. And by the way, your old life is gone, even the parts that maybe you loved. <sighs> Right. Yeah. I think, like, I also want to be careful with that kind of narrative, too, because I'm not, and I'm I'm not saying that you're saying this either. You Um, can. But as we know, we read into stories and what we're, what we're told, but I'm not one who believes that we have to suffer in order to learn or to um, experience pain in order to experience love. I think we can experience love without, you know, death essentially, right? Um, Oh yeah, 100% true. And so I think that transformation and that learning that you're naming, it would have been just as uncomfortable for everybody if they had stayed together and learned how to reconfigure their whole family. Um, That takes a, a different kind of discomfort and willingness to I mean, both ex- experience sacrifice in both of those scenarios. You're giving up something, whether willingly or you're being forced to. Um, so I'm going to name what's so obvious to me, but might not be on the minds of those at home. <laughs> um, I mean, this is the season we're walking into, Becca. This is yeah. the last Sunday yeah. that you and I get to do this. Like, oh. for those who have missed the boat, uh, <laughs> Becca is going on sabbatical. And she will be doing her own version, not of being banished to the desert, thank you. (laughs) Um, But of journeying into the unknown. And and she's going to be gone until uh, mid-September. It is a uh, completely normal thing and a good thing in ministry for a clergy person to take a sabbatical. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say that it's normal for congregations to be as supportive as ours is. And so I just want to say that out loud. Right. Uh, having experienced my own sabbatical last fall and now you having your first sabbatical um, mm-hmm. starting in, I don't know, three hours. <laughs> um, I mean, the learning that is going to take place and the transformation that is possible is huge. And we would be remiss if we thought it was only you that was going to do that. Um, Because the whole point of sabbatical is that we all learn how to do life differently. Like our family system as a congregation is going to change because you will not be among us. But that doesn't mean that you're the only one doing work. Like we have a lot of work to do on our end in learning. I have to learn how to be without you. Um, I have to learn how to not pick up the phone and text you in the moment that I need to. And, and I think you have probably some hopes for our congregation and what they can learn during this time. Um, so I wonder if you'll just offer us a couple thoughts before we mosey on out of, uh, cyberland here. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing, um, that we learned as a congregation during your sabbatical, I think even though we're very different and our leadership is different, I still have a similar hope for everyone, which is learning how to lean into each other and lead and empowering each other. Um, 
and believing that you're capable of doing that. Um, and rem I think we had a unique opportunity during your sabbatical in that it was a season of storytelling and we heard each other's stories um, of life and faith and, you know, a glimpse in the long journey of it. Um, and that's, um, that connection is what grounds community and um, that vulnerability, um, really deepening those roots um, reminds us of why we show up, why we're committed, um, why we love each other, even when it's hard. Um, and we're not out of that season where it's still a hard time to love each other because the world is hard and <laughs> human and it's messy. <laughs> Um, and oftentimes icky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, so I guess above all, my hope is that there's deep listening again. So. so why don't we just end with that question that you posed, which is how could Sarah have responded differently? Mm -hmm. And how can we do the same? Here's to the journey. Yeah. Come live in the light. Shine with the joy and the love of the Lord. We are called to be light for the kingdom.
Songs can shape prayers. Music can fill us up in ways that words sometimes cannot. Chrissy Searcy offered the basis for today's prayer as she reflected on her own experiences of singing and living her faith. Hagar, banished to the desert, also crafted a prayer. She cried out with desperation, and God responded with generosity. The scripture tells us that a well of water appeared before Hagar, and it was that water that nourished a nation. May this fountain be a source of inspiration and quiet meditation as we sing and pray together with God. We are called to act with justice. Remember when our family and so many other St. Peter's folks turned up at the town hall about building the mosque in our community? Remember the pain Sarah and Abraham caused when serving themselves and not acting with justice? We pray for the injustices of our own lives and in the lives of others. We are called to love tenderly. Remember our big church group marching in the pride parade and all the hugs we shared? Remember the way that Hagar nurtured Ishmael even in the most difficult season of their lives? We pray that we are able to love in gentle and bold ways even the ones whom we don't understand. We are called to serve one another. St. Peter's welcomes families who are experiencing homelessness. We supply food to those who need it. We sing for people living in care facilities. We partner with Washington United Church of Christ in Cincinnati and the Carmel Interfaith Alliance. And the list goes on. Sarah and Abraham and Hagar could have chosen to serve one another instead of hurting one another. We pray for those who need our help, and we pray for our ability to be helpers in a world of hurt. To walk humbly with God. Remember meditative walks on our labyrinth? Beautiful, frigid, reflective walks while on winter retreats? And solidarity walks along the U.S.-Mexico border? Think about the walk that Abraham had to take after banishing the mother of his child to the desert. We pray for the walks that we are taking in this season, walks of uncertainty, walks of loss and grief, walks of protest, walks of celebration and love. God, we pray with echoes of song, deep breaths and sighs of great pain. Fill us with hope as we unite our voices as one, using whatever words are comfortable and remembering. We are called. And praying the prayer of our Creator. Our Creator God, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. Amen.
Beloved, go from this time knowing that you are loved no matter what, that you are held gently by the Spirit. Know that you have been blessed to be a blessing in this world. So find a way in these three months and beyond to listen deeply, to love freely, and to create peace whenever you can. You are loved, you are held, you are blessed. Amen.